work as a, a head of HR for well, almost 15 years now in a, a different international organizations. So my background is truly HR, different functions, but in the last 10 years more towards a business partner role. And uh, yeah, I started cooperating with uh, uh, Pia Maria already, I think uh, three years ago, really talking more uh, about uh, the future role of HR in organizations towards more enabling uh, agile transformations. And uh, for tonight, this together and I also want to welcome the people who are part of the Amsterdam meetup group as uh, I have invited them to join this uh, uh, webinar tonight as uh, for this month uh, we are not hosting the monthly group uh, yeah of course due to uh, all the things happening around us with the um, coronavirus in a way but uh, I think this is also a great opportunity to connect and share uh, uh, using more the technology and uh, a new way of uh, sharing and uh, collaborating. So yeah, thanks uh, to everyone who is participating. Yeah, I think we need to see it as an opportunity, this coronavirus, because we can really, you know, start to meet more online and it's better for the environment and the climate and, and everything. So we are actually planning on doing a lot of online trainings moving forward uh, we are planning for releasing uh, that very soon in april uh, so that everybody can instead of uh, traveling and wasting a lot of resources can go online and get exactly the same training and the same very similar training experience as you get when you actually are in the room um i am pia maria Turian. I am a founder of Agile People. I call myself an inspiration director and I also um, see myself as a hybrid between IT, HR, leadership and um, uh, finance. Uh, and uh, I've been working extensively with implementing huge talent management systems in large Swedish corporations rolling out all over the world, you know, one size fits all, uh, same processes for everybody. And I realized this is not, not the way you should be doing it. You have to be more agile, you need to tailor for unique needs and you need to understand uh, users locally really and to work in smaller teams and self-organize, etc. So, um, I started to work with Agile in 2009 and um, Tamara, I think you, you contacted me when you were still in South America, didn't you? Correct. And, and that's when we had our first uh, contact and then um, we've been working together. This summer we did something interesting, um, the Agile People Manifesto. Uh, and um, you find it if you go to agilepeoplemanifesto.org. It's seven principles that we worked out uh, together, 19 persons from 15 different nationalities. Um, and uh, we thought there, there is a need for something more people related in, in Agile, not just software related. It's more about HR and leadership and how to work in organizations to really release potential in people. Okay, shall we kick this off? What do you say, Tamara? We, yes. we move on and um, I'm going to uh, go to our first slide. This is um, a slide that I very often use in the beginning of trainings or presentations, uh, and it's Charles Darwin. And he was known for, um, his works was called On the Origin of Species, but he also had this saying, survival of the fittest. And if you uh, interpret it, you can believe that he said that the strongest survive, but was that really what he meant? Um, what did he really mean with that expression, survival of the fittest? No, I won't. The species that adjust and adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, they are the species, animals or plants that survive and will continue to thrive. The ones that don't will die 
and the same goes for our organizations and that's why i put a little, a little dinosaur there because i think they are the perfect example of a species that could not adjust uh, when there were a lot of changes in the world now i have somebody want something let's see somebody's raising their hand uh, was that i am um, no no i don't see mm, okay let's move on a bit we'll have a small q a in the end of the session i thought so we can discuss a bit and then if you raise your hand we can uh, actually let you talk and, and uh, listen because now it's easier if not everybody is talking at the same time okay um this is what henry ford said thinking is the hardest work there is which is probably the reason why so few engage in it and it says something about the way he viewed people a few people in the top created structures of micromanagement that flowed top down on this time um, and he pretty much worked with cause and effect relationships. It's no longer possible today. The world is extremely complex. Uh, we all know about the changes that are happening all the time. Um, but um, this is the reason really why we need to change everything now because Taylorism and scientific management uh, was uh, how they worked in these Ford factories and people were indeed part of a machinery. They saw the organization as a machine uh, and scientific management was a theory of management that analyzed workflows and its main objective was to improve economic efficiency, especially labor productivity. And Taylorism was actually highly effective for meeting challenges of that time which was mainly about industrial manufacturing and logistics. So they built these management systems of standardization to create efficiency at the production line. And um, Douglas McGregor, uh, he wrote a book in the end of the 1950s called The Human Side of the Enterprise. And in this book, he talks about how we view other people, theory X and Y. And that is really um, about how the human mind works. Um, and this is interesting. Uh, if we view people as, as X, we think that they are lazy and unmotivated and they don't want to take responsibility. And if we view them as Y, we think that they want to be the best people they can be and they want to contribute to create value for others. And they will also do so if they get the right conditions and the right requirements. So this is the big difference in how we view people. And you can only go to yourself and think, how do you view yourself? Um, that most people say that, well, if I have the right conditions, I would like to, to create values for some other customer group and I'm motivated, I'm not lazy, etc. It's just other people who are X uh, persons, right? But the thing is that we structure organizations according to that. So how we view people affects very much how we structure our management processes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I wrote a book about this, um, 2017. It's called Agile People, a radical approach for HR and managers that leads to motivated employees. And then we had another book coming out actually last year. It's called the Agile People Picture Book, which consists of 220 pictures um, of Agile people. And it's a very good book to give to your management teams or your boards because they have very short attention span. And usually they want to, you know, get a um, very quick grasp of what is really agile and this is what you can do with this book so i can recommend ordering it on amazon i think tamara that we should discuss a little bit the problems that we see with traditional leadership and hr um, and i have a list of different problems 
please help me to, to explain them uh, to the audience tonight. We have this one. Would you like to talk about this picture, Tamara? Sure. Yeah. So this is definitely a, a picture that uh, um, kind of visualize what we have in mind when we are starting a project or when we have a plan in mind. Uh, so this is, is so clear. I have uh, uh, I've done my work. I know what it needs to be done. I know what are the needs of others. And then I will just uh, do it in the way I always done and, and just follow the plan. And it's going to go very uh, lightly, as we know. Maybe there's going to be some uh, slowdown, but no bumps in the road. When actually, when you look at reality, is uh, completely different than... Uh, we see here so many ups and down bridge and uh, waters to, to jump and uh, uh, storm and sunshine. And yeah, this is a little bit to uh, visualize how we could be uh, to put, yeah, like, let's say a project or something you have in mind in reality. And especially when it goes to implementation of uh, um, yeah, processes or things that you have in mind for your organization, for your product or for your uh, uh, internal customers so uh, yeah that's not how it works in reality and uh, uh, we have seen uh, in, uh, yeah, in, the, in the traditional way of uh, doing a project through the waterfall with, I'm not sure if we have the slide later to show it and when we change the way of doing in a more agile way keep it into consideration the full context the unpredictability of uh, uh, yeah things around us the environment uh, so the main point is that we need to change the mentality that we can control everything and, and have a clear path to a mentality where actually everything is to be unpredictable and we need to constantly adapt to what is ahead of us in order to really make sure we are uh, ready to uh, change uh, uh, change direction, go a little bit up, down, and really trying to move step by step towards the, the goal we have in mind and our final objective. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think it's very it's very actual picture. It's it's very because now with the, with the, this um, disease, the virus, and everything. Uh, Your example. Yeah, a very good example of what is happening you know now everybody have to change behaviors stop flying instead go online use technology a lot more and a lot of, of, of things are, are being disrupted but we still need to to survive i mean we still need to go on and find solutions so we try to find alternative paths instead of the ones that we thought we would move in and um it's not really about um, making money anymore. You're not in business mainly to, to make money because value comes first and the value creation process happens in, in a complex uh, network that the organization is and between customers and employees in an iterative manner. Um, and Profits and income will be the consequence if we have a good value creation process. The value creation process must come first. So that we cannot really focus on the shareholders or the profit because then we have the wrong focus. The focus has to be on the value creation process instead of on the profits and shareholders for the future. Um, Frederick Laloux, he said in his book, Reinventing Organizations, that profit is like the air we breathe. We need air to live, but we don't live to breathe. And I think that's a very good explanation uh, of what we are trying to, to show here. What, what else do we have? What, what other problems do we have uh, in, in, um, uh, in our organizations today? Well, in many organizations, we're trying to do big transformations, big changes uh, to uh, adapt to the changing environment and the changing needs of customers and of uh, 
economy and, and uh, to, to keep up with competition. And managers here are really, you know, middle management, they feel a bit threatened, to say the least, in, in this kind of organization. And when there is so much change and everybody is, um, seems to be able to manage by themselves without any leaders anymore. We don't need so much money management anymore. On Ford's time, there was a lot of need for management and the gap between the workers and management uh, was large, huge gap. The, the managers had all the knowledge and competence and information and the workers didn't have any at all. Uh, and this gap has of course shrinked uh, tremendously due to um, the, the access to education, training, information, knowledge, and that gives power to everybody really to, to be uh, as, as informed as any manager. So I think managers from the old paradigm can, can feel this as, as a small threat or a big threat to their role. What happens to me here? in this situation. And there, there are also uh, big um, gaps in um, the engagement of people. Gallup is doing this report regularly where they look at uh, engagement and motivation of the workplace, the global workplace and the state of the global workplace. We know uh, that we have uh, big challenges here um, and hundreds of uh, thousands of employees uh, were interviewed here from 155 different countries and they were asked about what the most important things at work uh, uh, are and if they currently get this in their organizations. Um, this is a result uh, where they look at how many are engaged on average in the world? 15% only. It's the green figure there. In, on average in the world, it's 15%. 18% are not engaged, and 67% are more or less indifferent. So um, these are alarming figures. What else do we have? We have traditional performance ratings, which is a big problem year is uh, too long to make performance uh, plans and to, to set goals today. There is no productivity when we work with this. We focus on judging the past, the history. And the person who is judging is almost always the boss. And does the boss know best how I have performed? Maybe not. Maybe there are other people in the organization who knows better how I have performed. Maybe my peers know better. It's connected to salary, which leads to sandbagging, where people want to set as low goals as possible because they know that if they reach them, they will get a reward, right? And it, of course, management want them to set as high goals as, as possible. So this is a conflict uh, built in. Uh, Sub-optimizing effect. Effects breed competition, not cooperation, and a lot of bad behaviors. We focus on the wrong things. It's just results and not behaviors. So we have a lot of problems with the traditional performance ratings. What else? People with targets will probably reach their targets, even if they destroy the enterprise, because this drive to, um, if, if you say, do this and get that, is so strong. So we uh, have problems with this as well. Bad system will be to good person every time. Actually, 95% of performance lies in the system, not in the, uh, in the people. So we need to fix the system, not the actual people. And there are different exercises you can do to show this. And uh, I usually do that in my trainings to kind of prove that it's not about um, the competence of, of the people always. It's, it's about the whole system and improving the whole system so that people get the right conditions and prerequisites to uh, perform. Because you can be fantastic, but if we put you in a, 
in a bad system, you will not be able to perform anyway. And you can be quite mediocre and we put you in a good system, you will be fantastic. Uh, so it's more about the system than about the actual people. Um, I have a picture about control too, and the definition here is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And in business terms, that means controlling people and controlling the future. But we know that this is a, just an illusion. We cannot control people and we cannot control the future. Uh, the grand illusion is that people can and must be managed and that the future is predictable and manageable. This is, of course, a problem in, in, a, in a changing reality, a complex world where everything is changing all the time. Um, no predictability, and we cannot really control uh, people. So we have a lot of problems with the budget as well. It's a very time-consuming process that takes up a lot of, of management and uh, HR's time. Assumptions that you do when you make the budget are very quickly outdated and old uh, when the world is changing. It stimulates unethical behaviors, bad behaviors, you know, political exercises and brown nosing and uh, competition in organizations, which is not good for the whole performance of the whole organization. It also creates illusions of control. You, you think you have control, but you really don't. And decisions are made very early and often too high. And it guarantees actually, of course, that we have the plan costs because people are very, um, very uh, fuzzy about using their budgets, their cost budgets, but it doesn't guarantee that we have the planned revenues. And it can prevent other value adding activities that we could do if we didn't have all uh, the stuff planned out a year before. So this is a big problem when the world is changing exponentially. What's interesting is that the person who uh, actually discovered or came up with the budget. That was Arthur McKinsey, and he did that um, over a hundred years ago. Um, and then we all know what happened to uh, McKinsey and his company, and they worked with these management methods, uh, budgeting, pay for performance, uh, you know, all these kinds of consultancy methods. Uh, and maybe we have seen uh, a little bit the end of these uh, methods now. There is a big paradigm shift happening in the world today. Uh, Peter Drucker said already in the 1950s that most of what we call management is by, about making it difficult for people to do their job. So they were very early understanding uh, these things. What else do we have? We have psychological safety. There is a lack of psychological safety in the workplace today. And then you can actually ask yourself, what should we then do instead? Because we have all these problems. What, what should we do about it? Well, we need to, to find um, frameworks and, and ways of working that are different from the ways we have been working. So I would like to introduce to you first the Agile HR overview, the way that we, we have to change HR, how we work in, in the future. Um, and maybe Tamara, yeah. getting tired of speaking, so maybe- I can take it from here, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so I, I think indeed, if we look at the role that HR can play in all this arena, I mean, we have seen a little bit from previous slides and research uh, how the um, workforces uh, or the people are disengaged in the work environment. And I will see this, big undecided people if they are happy or not happy engaged or not engaged 60 percent of the population that we uh, work every day with so if we think about it as a focus for 
for us as uh, people uh, leaders would be indeed uh, to, to start to think about designing uh, the right program and system uh, to really uh, foster this. So moving from a more traditional way of uh, um, working in organizations that were focusing on control and alignment, and therefore the HR role in this kind of organizations is really uh, helping the execution and the control. Um, and therefore the role is to uh, build standard procedure processes that uh, drive alignment and execution. Um, moving more towards a new way of thinking where actually, uh, as we have seen in this world of unpredictability, the right way to respond instead of controlling is most probably um, to adapt, to innovate, to listen uh, to our customer and move faster than the competitors to answer to their needs. What is the HR role there in there is, of course, to help our internal customer and our people um, to foster collaboration, innovation, um, team decision making, and how to do this if not implementing the right programming system that will able to do that. We talked before about how to change possibly the uh, performance management uh, system or um, internal uh, uh, feedback culture or um, talent development. So these are some of the topics we often talk also in our um, training and how and we help um, people to understand how to implement this in the organization. Mm -hmm. You want to continue? Yeah. So if we look indeed at the old way, I mean, I, I work in HR for several years, so I, I also, uh, let's say, uh, um, witness this shift. Uh, I was lucky enough also to work for organization that already shift in this new way, but I was also part of the previous way of working, which is not to judge what is right or what is wrong, but it's more to think about how to really reconsider our position there. So if we traditionally look at the uh, HR strategy or people department strategy, most of the time this get designed by our uh, leadership team in HR. Uh, then they work together with the program managers or leaders from the uh, COE, so the center of expertise, and then these people design the program has the HR leads had in mind. And then when this is all done, designed and dusted, they uh, kind of send it to uh, the local um, uh, HR managers or people in the regions to work towards the implementations. So it's more a sort of pushing um, uh, strategy rather than pull strategy. And uh, with this, they start also thinking about what measure we can implement if uh, these projects uh, are not, or processes are not respected, or if uh, we do not accomplish the numbers we had in mind at the beginning of uh, adoption, etc. And then the program gets revised after a year or two after launching. Um, clearly, I think I have uh, personally uh, been part of some of these uh, big projects with lots of energy from everyone was put in there, from every HR person, every, everyone in the team that was working on this, to arrive at the end when actually the business receiving the project or the, or the system or the product was actually not um, really enthusiastic as we were at the beginning of this project. So actually maybe even criticizing or thinking, okay, this is another HR tool that I needed to use and put on our checklist. Otherwise I get 2000 reminders that I have to do it. And I don't think this is what we had in mind when starting, oh, I really want to develop something that people can use and really be engaged and, and use it because they think it's adding value to their everyday life at work. So why instead of changing the mindset and start identify what is the problem we are trying to solve from a different angle? and maybe start with uh, uh, including more people from uh, uh, different function in business from the beginning. Uh, in that way, we can really start this um, way of thinking in uh, small steps and uh, really start co-creating a product together and uh, maybe implementing the first uh, solution or draft with small uh, part of the business to really see 
uh, what is the feedback that we get back from that? So testing in, uh, uh, in a way that can uh, provide meaningful feedback so that we can iterate again on the product and build a, a better platform there. Uh, I think this is a better way that would lead to success of adoption of a specific product and really create the engagement um, we want to have. Um, I recently participate one of these uh, projects when we changed the uh, promotion process in our organization and, the, and indeed the engagement from the business was much higher because they became the ambassador of this new product in, within the communities and the team and whenever there were questions or concern coming out from the people itself, they were the one to answer and to say, oh yeah, yes, oh, we didn't think about it, we will keep it in mind for next time. Please continue using, continue testing and provide feedback to us. And now we are going to move into the third iteration. But I think this is probably the future uh, way of working on this kind of, uh, of process. Hmm. So why is it, uh, Tamara, that HR need to lead the transformation here from traditional to more agile organizations? Yeah, for sure. I think that for a long time, this function has been, uh, in, let's say, in the back seat. Uh, it has been, I don't know what happened towards uh, during the last uh, 30 years where actually, uh, yeah, HR was a little bit more in a reactive uh, position rather than be uh, active or uh, very close to, uh, uh, to the, the, the business stakeholders or people. Um, and considering that actually we do have a privileged role in the organization, I always say that because we are clearly in HR the only function that has ramification everywhere in the organization. So we do know how our people feel in different parts of the organization and what they really want. Uh, and therefore, we have also a, a possibility to decide of what kind of structure um, we can put in place to really support the people to perform at their best and therefore uh, reaching the organizational goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, consider indeed that HR is overseeing important areas like, I don't know, the talent acquisition, so we can have a say about how to recruit the talents, what to look in, in the people that we want to have uh, as part of our organizations. People development, I mean, of course, this is part of uh, everyday life for us, how to develop the right skills, how to identify the gaps that we have and how to help uh, the people to, uh, to, let's say, bridge those gaps. Um, we touch about uh, leadership development, uh, we uh, talk every day in everything we do of change management and we, last but not least, we discuss the engagement part and the great opportunity we have to create a more engaged workforce. So therefore, I strongly believe that there is an opportunity uh, to help steering the organization uh, yeah, towards a more agile approach, but also helping achieving the uh, the value creation that we talked at the beginning that will lead later to uh, yeah, profit or shareholders um, uh, happiness, let's say. Yeah. So uh, employee engagement is big here. And um, it's really about finding that intrinsic motivation and engagement in people. And how, how do you do that? What, what is the definition really of employee engagement? Well, it's an equation between employee satisfaction and organizational contribution. One of them is not enough. You need both to be um, really engaged. Uh, the happy sleeper down there in the corner is very happy and satisfied, but it doesn't contribute to the organizational goals very much. And the other guy up in the corner, the crash and burner, is very frustrated, doesn't feel very good, but is contributing every time to uh, organizational goals, maybe hitting the results every month. But actually we need to create that direction for all our employees up to the corner where we see this jumping, agile, happy employee who is engaged because he or she has high levels on both employee satisfaction and organizational contribution. 
uh, and that's how we would like to define employee engagement. When it comes to enabling skill development and, and growth and um, talking about job descriptions and roles etc we see a, a shift here as well we we don't close people into boxes in in agile anymore instead we use your job role should be a stepping stone that's where you start and then you uh, develop yourself into a t-shaped person who is uh, great at one or many specialist areas but also have a broad general base today we talk, talk about both t-shaped competence but also pie-shaped and m-shaped and even comb-shaped is the last uh, and and the broader you are the more valuable you become for the organization then you have a better view of how does really you know value uh, how is value created in this organization you know this because you have different perspectives and you can understand how everything fits together and this creates flexibility not just for the person but also for the team and the whole organization so you have a, a possibility to broaden or deepen your competence depending on what you are interested in and um, in the team it creates uh, flexibility when everyone can take on each other's tasks. And um, we also learn all the time in the team from each other. We try many different things. So uh, this is a very good uh, way of seeing how should we develop people, not just becoming more specialists, but becoming wider in our competence as well. So we have some principles for Agile HR. Uh, instead of developing policies, rules and standards, we want to support flexibility, speed and collaboration. And instead of, you know, delivering programs and processes to the customers, which we've always been doing in the past, now it's about involving the customer in the delivery. And instead, instead of working in a specific HR role, like uh, an HR specialist, recruiter or administrator or something else, we want T-shaped HR people who can take many different roles. And we work more in teams than individually. We can also look at value stream-based HR, where we look at all the things that would create value from, for example, a potential candidate to onboarded employees. And from jobs and positions, we move to playing many different roles. From HR projects, we can work with stable, high-performing teams instead. And instead of promotions and bonus programs, we can work with different ways of compensating people, salary formulas, profit sharing. It could also actually be performance related. And there are uh, different tools and systems that you can use like Merit Money or Bonusly or, you know, simple web-based tools that can be used for uh, deciding about who should have how much. Uh, instead of delivering programs and processes, the main task of HR is to support the organization to perform. And of course, no size fits all in the future. We cannot work with one size fits all because there are different needs on local level. Instead of having the HR recipe, we understand we need to experiment and work with trial and error because that's the best way of learning and continuously improve. And Back to human view X, we need to have human view Y. We need to believe in people and believe that they want to be the best people they can be in this, uh, in this life. And that, that we, they want to take responsibility and create value and be motivated. Now we turn to leadership, agile leadership for the future of work. And we move here in agile leadership from managing performance uh, that's when we have this controlling manager who is micromanaging the people. Although there may be people who have better ideas that could contribute to a situation or a decision, but uh, that's not really asked for in this situation. Instead, we want to see uh, managers enabling performance. 
uh, and that means that their main task becomes to remove obstacles uh, and the hinders on uh, and the impediments for people. Yeah, and so, you also mentioned how important it is for this kind of manager to build a psychological safety, right? Mm -hmm. Really avoid that. Um, yeah, the the, uh, the the people are afraid to speak up, or they're just say, okay, I have to do what. My manager is telling me without actually feel free to share different point of view or ideas. Um, so I think it's also yeah a, a, a very important uh, uh, mm. for a manager to enable this change. Yeah, and, and how do how can managers do that? Um, well, they can ask a lot of questions. They can show that they are vulnerable. They yeah. can say, for example, I made a mistake. And in some organizations today, uh, you have these evenings where, where leaders stand up and they tell about their mistakes in front of uh, employees. What, what happens when leaders do that is that people feel safe to make mistakes themselves and they, it opens up for learning. Instead of covering up our mistakes, we are then more willing to show what we did wrong and learn from it and then everybody uh, learns so it, it's just a win-win solution uh, when it comes to, to leadership we've been dealing with administrative leadership that's the rocking horse it's when we have a, a checklist a report a status report you know um, a system a process for everything we do. We take goals from above and we break them down below. That's not really leadership. Um, leadership is when we make people go in the direction that we want them to go because they want to go in that direction. That's real leadership. And it, that takes a lot more competence. It's a lot more difficult than just filling in a checklist or writing a status report. Um, would, you, would also, you like to talk about the yeah. garden? Yeah. There's also a very beautiful metaphor of the role of a leader, uh, where we see the company indeed as a garden, a garden uh, full of uh, flowers, plants, or trees. So, meaning maybe every, every uh, garden has a different purpose. And uh, uh, the leader is really the gardener there that takes care of all these different uh, plants, of trees, of flowers. And uh, um, the importance here is uh, not necessarily um, if these plants or flowers are different, but is the fact that the gardener or the leader understand those differences and really understand how to nurture them, where to put them. Some of them are, uh, are going to flower and flourish only under the sunshine and other only in a shadow situation. So understanding these uh, differences uh, we make the garden uh, even, yeah, more, definitely more beautiful and, uh, and uh, for everyone to observe. So, um, again, this by, it's not important what is the purpose again here. Every uh, gardener can, and every garden can have different things, but it's important to understand what the purpose is in order to make the plants and, uh, and the vegetable flowers there really flourishing. Mm -hmm. That's the only way um, they really can achieve the whole purpose is, is, is yes. if we can make these prerequisites in the soil, we can understand what they need. Um, and, and this is the competence that the gardener needs to have. So the leader needs to know the people. If the leader doesn't know people, it's not a, a people manager. Yeah. Um, about yeah. A little bit about culture. Yeah. What is culture? <laughs> yeah, I think also this is a little bit going back of the prerequisite you were talking about. If we look at this uh, uh, function or equation, and this is an equation indeed from uh, Living, and it's quite an old uh, uh, equation, is indeed from the 1936, and uh, uh, is still valid today. I mean, of course, there are. Uh, people that may uh, have a question against it, but basically this psychological equation about behavior says that behavior is a function 
of a person in their environment. Um, so what does practically means? Um, that basically uh, you have things on yourself uh, or behavior, like uh, that are the things that are affecting your behavior. And these are definitely uh, one, the personality. And second is the environment where you live or you work. Um, so personality is something that is probably difficult to change at some point, but uh, changing the behavior uh, is what will make uh, something change in the person. So uh, to change the behavior, we'll really need to shape the environment around us. Why this is important to, uh, to understand, especially in HR, I would say, is that because if we, uh, if we would uh, we start or as a company aligning the processes, the system or the tools with the culture uh, we have or the values we live in every organization, uh, then we will start seeing the right behavior from our employees. For example, if one of the uh, values of the, of the company, of the culture is working, uh, collaborate, working together, then we needed to, to change something in the environment that is facilitating this. And there even could be an environment change. So maybe creating open space and not having closed offices or encourage more uh, big team meeting instead of one-on-one -on -one changes. So um, there are different things that can be changed that would foster uh, the collaboration part. Hmm. A good example of uh, where you change the environment to affect behavior of people is actually in the, in the airport in Amsterdam, where you live, Tamara. Uh, <laughs> in Schiphol. <laughs> yeah. <I> really know <laughs> what I'm going to say. It's about the fly in the porcelain in, in the men's bathroom, right? Uh, because men like to aim when they pee. So then they had a problem. It was dirty, you know, everywhere they were being outside of, of, uh, of the thing there. And with a fly inside, they changed the behavior. So you, need, you can be able to change behaviors by changing the environment because we cannot really change people's personalities. Okay, what about this one? Yeah, this is uh, the principles indeed summarizing how can we move from uh, uh, yeah, building on control to build on motivation as leaders or to communicate just, you know, be a former manager. So really more top down towards more having a sort of uh, free flow between people networking. So that means moving from more a formal leadership to an informal one. Uh, avoiding micromanaging um, and so more explaining the why and then leave the how to the people so, so uh, that's an important aspect and role for a leader be very transparent especially when uh, sharing information and when it comes to manager deciding on the performance of our employees of employees in general why we don't ask employees to decide uh, on the, the performance from themselves or encourage more peer feedback, for example. Um, decision making is no longer done by manager, but everybody should be involved in a decision making as the people more close to the problem are usually the one who have the best answer. Um, goals should not be set completely by the manager, but by individual and teams, and yes, maybe with the support from the manager or the view. Moving more uh, to OKRs rather than uh, just smart goals. And uh, fostering an environment of self-leadership, just instead of, so this also um, uh, talk about ownership, so in self-ownership. And then, as we said before, moving this idea, the human view X towards uh, the human view Y. Hmm. So that's the move that, that leaders are doing. Now, we'll take a look at the roles of the Agile People Coach, because this is a new role that we see uh, is emerging in, in, in work life today. And HR and leaders are moving in this same direction to become, you know, Agile People Coaches. What is that really? 
Well, if we compare um, an agile coach with an agile people coach, an agile coach has a very heavy process focus. Uh, they also know something about people, of course, about the product and about technology often. Uh, where, whereas uh, an agile people coach is much more uh, people uh, skilled uh, and knows more deep about uh, people and how they function and why they do what they do. Uh, and these are skills that, that are the most important for an agile people coach. It's not so much process, uh, it's not so much product, and they might not need so much tech. Um, knowledge either. If we look at uh, uh, what perspectives we can uh, put on agile coaching and agile people coaching, we have in agile coaching the smallest piece here is really the team. We work as a team facilitator and if you also work um, with, with many teams and facilitate coordination between teams, you call yourself an agile coach and if you also work on uh, the bigger organizational level you can call yourself an enterprise agile coach um, now when it comes to the agile people coach you can also work on the individual level it's about building self-leadership in yourself accepting yourself and also helping to coach other people as a leader or as a coach or as an HR person or in any of the other roles that an agile people coach can take. And then we also have other levels. We have team leadership, um, taking people from uh, immature teams to high performing teams. And then we have the structures and the culture of the whole organization. So we have in um, Agile People uh, Coaching, we have nine different roles. Um, we have the, the trainer, we have the mentor, we have the guide, the, the reflective observer, uh, the navigator who knows something about the company's system and ha have, have competence about systems theory, the facilitator who facilitates how we can make decisions and how we can move things forward without putting yourself inside so much and the coach so you, you of course need uh, deep skills in agile and lean and you, you need to live um, agile rather than just do agile you need to be agile uh, living the principles and the mindset and, and be the change that you want to see yourself maybe you come from a leadership role maybe you come from an HR professional uh, role and you develop into this agile people coach the reflective observer here is a bit different from the other roles um, it's when you put yourself outside of the system the whole organizational system and you uh, think about okay now when I step into the system again what role can I then uh, make myself most useful in so I can step in and out of of the system and reflect on uh, What should I do when I step in again because it's about picking the right role Depending on the situation that you have in front of you and the problems that you are facing So we created this new role because we believe it's crucial for HR and leaders to change their role fundamentally uh, for the future of work uh, when, when uh, we no longer need the micromanaging uh, person and we don't need so much policies, we don't need a lot of processes and rules, we actually need people and relationships more than processes and tools and that, as you know, is the first value of the Agile Manifesto as well. And we can only change organizations by removing those limiting structures that we have uh, in most organizations together. We cannot do it alone. HR cannot do it alone. Leaders cannot do it alone. We need to work together to do that. Um, and of course, Agile is not a recipe for success. 
and best practice is always old practice and only mediocre companies use best practice today because you will never be better than your competitors if you use uh, best practice today. So you need to invent your own solutions and your own ways of working and recipes for success by trying out different things, by working with experimentation. So usually I say that Agile is an anti-recipe. It's the absence of a recipe. Um, and, and we actually need to try different things to see what works for us in our situation. Uh, having said that, I'm going to give you a small recipe. Uh, that's always fun, I think, to say. Uh, step number one is to change or remove the limiting structures. Mainly, these structures come from finance and HR in organizations. And uh, then we start to support uh, people by introducing new structures that instead of hindering us would support us to work in more adaptable and flexible manners where we can improvise. And then we make it also easy to behave according to the agile mindset when we have supporting structures. And uh, we go on and show these new behaviors that come from learning new ways of acting and working. And then we repeat again from one. So maybe say something about the Agile People Manifesto last, Tamara, what do you say? Yeah, well, I think we have introduced in this also at the beginning. This is a manifesto that we developed last summer, like where uh, indeed 19 uh, people from different part, uh, kind of uh, part of the world went together and start thinking about more uh, yeah, the people side, so not only the software part. And, we were able to put together together seven principles and as you mentioned we do have them very well explained in our agilepeoplemanifesto.org uh, page and uh, i also personally took uh, the principles as a way of leading my meetups here in amsterdam as i believe is important to deep dive in all of them and understand where they can apply in our daily uh, working life uh, so these are also my guiding principle in what I do uh, uh, every day when I go to work and uh, are very important to, uh, for me to create an impact not only uh, at work but around me and in the society in general. Mm. You can apply it really to many different situations and circumstances. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. You are welcome to join us. Uh, we are the Agile People community, the global community of Agile People. And you can participate in one of these Agile People coach training somewhere in the world near you. And then you become one of us. Uh, so you can look, more, uh, look for more information at agilepeople.com slash events. Um, that's the email, uh, web address, the URL that we are using uh, for all our trainings across the world. We have a, a number of different trainings there. And then I will see if I can open up for some questions. I'm just going to um, stop to record here.